So nice to meet you all, and uh, thanks again to Professor Chung for a very inspiring talk, and I feel actually very humbled to give a talk after you. <laughs> so I'll be talking about the present and future of BCI technology in the field of communication. So um, at the V Center, it's located in Switzerland, in Geneva. It's next to the Geneva um, Botanical Garden. And we have uh, two sister campuses in Zurich and Boston. And I will, uh, it, it's re relatively recent uh, institute. So it's, uh, we are expanding fast. And I would like to share some of the research from our institute. And not only us, but also from around the world. So about the target population. So uh, we have patients having severe impairment in motor or language function, and they can be the target for PCI-based technology. This includes such as dysarthria, who has a difficult difficulty uh, to talk properly due to the motor function disability, and also anarthria, similar, but cannot com completely uh, cannot speak at all. And also aphasia, the unable to think of a specific words due to the impairment in language cognition. And there's also this category of people such as locked-in syndrome. And today I will showcase one example of uh, one special case of locked-in syndrome. It's called a completely locked-in syndrome patient that we worked with. And in this case, the patient cannot even move eyes there's no remaining movement at all. And mostly caused by stroke, it's very common, or Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS, as, as she mentioned, tumor infection, trauma, et cetera. So the patients having, of course, alternative functions of uh, communication could benefit from AAC, as you, as you saw. And it will be, of course, also discussed in more detail by the esteemed speakers after me. So some very quick background. So roughly, it can be categorized into either invasive or non-invasive. And EG, you already saw previously. It's an, uh, you kind of people use, uh, you saw a lot of people uh, like in the research um, showcases where they wear this kind of special cap on the scalp. And this has been used also a lot. But also there's uh, non-invasive, but without the electrophysiology, that is non-electrical activity um, sensing methods, such as these three, magnetoencephalography, FNIRS, and fMRI. But today's focus will be the third one. It will be from the implantable devices, such as sensors implanted on the brain or in the brain, but mostly under the skull with the electrophysiology. And I will showcase three examples. Well, first one is microelectrode array, which is the, this case. And this is the brain cortex. This is the skull. And this is your, your skin, scalp. And also ECOG, it's electrocorticography. It's usually placed on top of the brain. And the um, SEG, the stereotactic uh, EG. And this is not shown here, but it goes very deep. But it's also kind of minimally invasive. And recently, it has been used more often than ECOG. So it's been a new source of data for us for analysis. So we have recently started a new experiment with SEG just to see its potential. And I will sh share some of the results from this too. So there are many different types of uh, decoding. So you, you can decode at the phoneme level, that is building blocks of sound. You can also do at the word level, sentence level. And obviously, as it goes below, you can use more contextual information. So that it helps decoding. Even if you make mistake and certain phoneme, certain word, you can infer and correct wrong ones so to increase your accuracy. And this is a very brief, uh, there was a nice survey paper about how the information flow in time. 
and it was published 2021. And I just thought that it's nice to just show how the, it's, it's a, there's a complex network for, for language in the brain. And these numbers show the median time in travel in millisecond unit. So there's this kind of, okay, I, I, I want to say something, and I think of some, conceptualize some word, and they finally, they're articulated through the motor area. So depending on where you target and where you get information from, you have different types, different modalities of PCI. So I will show one case that we did about just three, three years ago at Fis Center. So we had a patient in Germany, so next to Switzerland, and we, had, uh, we implanted two microelectrode arrays, 64 channels each, in primary motor cortex and supplementary motor area. This related to your movement. This was the setup. So the patient was lying down on his bed. We added BCI stuff. We connected his brain to the computer. So simple, but not that simple. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, procedures we had to go through. But this is the concept. And after we connected, now the computer can read the brain signals. And I, I mind you, it's just signals. It's nothing of a mind or your, your intention or your secrets. So this is a protocol we used. So assume that we have, a, like I said, 128 channels in total. And each electrode gives some kind of, let's say, bursts of signals. It's called action potentials. And we have a, let's say, we monitor like per second how many bursts do we see. And this becomes the input to our AI model. Now what you're seeing in the second is the after the counting, so it's fire, we call it firing rate. And then we have a classifier that outputs the maps, this a lot of information. We have 128 such lines. The map to, oh, I think the patient is trying to say no or, or yes. It's a simple binary classification. And we mapped also into the sound, the different frequency. So there's a real-time feedback to the patient that oh, you're maybe thinking yes, you're maybe thinking no, because the patient has no. Uh, is the computer understanding correctly? And it's not guaranteed to understand correctly. It's actually a very difficult process. And so this project was led by uh, our colleague at Fee Center, Dr. Jonas Zimmerman. And the basically, after this running this protocol, for example, in this case, the patient wants to say, uh, click the letter S. So there, the first row, the computer shows, hey, is letter S here? Yes or no? Then the patient tries to maintain no. Then it goes low, and then there'll be low sound. And after 500 milliseconds, it's selected, and then it goes to the second row. Okay, is it here? So he said, yes. And then, is it this letter? No. So it goes to the second letter. And then there's a double confirmation just to make sure that the, the letter selected is indeed correct. So I will sh show you the real video at the patient's place. So it's in German. Nine. So nine for no Good. and yeah for yes. Good. So it goes to the second row here now. Nine. Now S. S. Mm -hmm. Nine. Now. L. Nine. Nope, not this letter. O. Yes, this letter. O. So it. Yeah. And then double confirmation. You see, it's terribly slow, but it was still working and. For a patient who cannot give any kind of movement cue, so here, what patient said was, "Guys, it just works like this." And there were many each multiple sentences. I'm just showing you the last sentence. So after this, uh, this was a case with the microelectrode arrays. 
So the problem of the microelectrode array is that it's, it, it generally, not always, but has this longevity problem. The signal quality degrades after a few years. So at some point, we had to stop uh, this experiment. So there are many different also alternative met methods of sensing. Another one is the famous work, and probably some of you already know this work. It's by the Eddie Chang's group in the US. And this one uses the electrocorticography, where the electrodes are placed on top of the brain. They used a lot of electrodes, huge. <laughs> Here they uh, used the avatar to give a real-time feedback. And in this work, they achieved more than 70 words per minute in for decoding. And the patient was suffering from anarthria, and also the patient is uh, quadriplegia. So the patient, meaning that patient cannot move uh, four limbs, and patient cannot speak at all. It can only make some sound, like a, a, a sound but it's completely not distinguishable. And they found also some interesting uh, electrodes, in fact that some electrodes correspond to different types of movement of your mouth. And just, I will show you just two videos and that I find interesting. So here, the first is the case of patient uh, trying to speak a sentence. And patient is silently trying to speak here. I think you are wonderful. And the voice here is actually interesting because they also use the patient's voice before the injury. And they synthesized to recover her voice. Give me a few minutes. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good, I would say. So here we're seeing a different target population here. So depending on the patient, we need to optimize and what define different strategies of, of PCI. Voice? So it works like this, and I will go to the next one. Just one more, because I thought it's in, in, interesting to see this video as well, because it's not directly communicating using words, but it's also, you know, communication can convey subtle voice cues, emotions, uh, many different expressions of your feeling. And they try to decode the emotional state and different states of the patient, like surprised in this case, to give more expressive uh, means of communication. So I will skip this, so it works as such. <laughs> So the third example is the one we have done recently at Fee Center. And this was done in collaboration with Geneva University Hospital. And this was a case where we, there were, we had an epilepsy patient in the epilepsy unit. And the doctor implanted this stereotactic EEG or SEG with uh, this tetrode. So it has uh, electrodes on, on the shaft as well as the tip here. So in total, we had over 200 electrodes altogether. And we tried to see which area of the brain and which depth give more information. And this is based on the decoding accuracy. And we did some reverse engineering to see, uh, did, did some, we did feature analysis to see which elect electrodes contributed most on decoding. So when you use all electrodes, it was still the best. And the cortex electrodes, the, the brain surface, and the deep electrodes. So most of the information was on the cortex level, and we have more 
detailed results, but this is kind of uh, expected at this, with this protocol. And some accuracy metrics. So we had four words. We thought this can be practical uh, for patients in real scenario. So this patient was for research, but yes, no, pain. I want to watch TV. So we use four word decoding. Room to improvement, but it's, uh, it's on the way. And this is something interesting we found. So this is called spectrogram. The, every sound or every signal we can decompose into different frequency components. And this is time in seconds. And we can have more intuitive understanding on what's going on in the brain signal. So using this technique, we saw uh, the, with the multiple trials, uh, there's a different common patterns that can be used to distinguish different words. And you can think of, it, uh, think of this as image and imagine yourself doing, uh, I want to distinguish based on the image, what is the word the patient was saying. So this was the whole purpose of the experiment. And going from this, and this is the final slide before the conclusion, so we are very excited to work with the Severance Hospital in South Korea with a professor, Hyun Jung here. And actually, some of his team and also the collaborators are in the back. So here, we will target decoding of Korean words. And it will be, for now, intraoperative intra clinical trial, so during the surgery and soft, using the soft flexibly uh, grids. So this is something that is novel from uh, Switzerland that we are collaborating with a company called Neurosoft, led by Dr. Nicholas uh, Fakikuras. And they developed this folding, foldable soft electrode that can self-expand after inserting through the borehole, which is a standard uh, surgery technique. So it's like one centimeter, maybe around to, you know, like a hole, and you can put this and then you can expand like, like petal of the flower. So we are aiming to test this method and collect data and try more uh, trials. So in conclusion, BCI technology for communication will offer transformative potential for individuals who have lost ability to speak and more advanced and sophisticated algorithms have been developed recently, and this is very timely, and it's really boosting the performance. And innovation is recording hardware is also very timely. There have been many minimal invasive as well as powerful non-invasive neuroimaging techniques being developed, and this is just perfect timing for us. So yes, as, you, as, I sh as, I, as I showcase, there are multiple approaches being experimented in parallel. From, so there was also speech th synthesis that uh, I showed briefly, but also there's another experiment that showed that you can directly synthesize in real time from the brain signal itself and word decoding. And we can probably go even go, go beyond this, this uh, state of the art that I show you as a second case. So some of the future challenges, standardization, benchmarking. So this is still it's so developing so fast, the standardization and policy making cannot catch up yet. But I believe this will happen with a more collaborative effort and ethical frameworks governance. Now this is becoming a real deal. <laughs> it's a compl complex issue, but someone has to do it. And advances in AI models. This is also, in my opinion, a very critical uh, element. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to talking with you more in, in person. <laughs>